Well, anyone who has children or grandchildren or nieces or nephews know that they don't always obey, right? Shocker, wow, newsflash. <laughs> but what particularly irked me with my children was when I would ask them to do something. Say, I would say, go upstairs and clean your room. And then I'd go up a little bit later to inspect. And there they'd be, sitting on their bed, playing on their phone. And I'd say, I thought I asked you to clean your room. To which they would reply, I know. You know. That's supposed to make me feel better. The fact that you know and you're not doing it actually makes me feel worse. So I would counter with no to the point of doing. No to the point of doing. And so it is with knowing and doing, there is that connection. And what can frustrate us with our kids, we can actually do with God, right? When we know things and we don't do them. And in our passage this week, we saw a lot of we knows, right? Things that we know. So let's open our Bibles and take a look at that about what we're supposed to know and what we're supposed to do. So we're going to start a little bit before our passage. So we're going to start in verse 13. So we're going to be at 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. And we're going to look at seven we knows in our passage. And this is under the pericope, under the heading of that you may know. And I didn't even count that, so that could make it an eight we know. So starting in verse 13, follow along with me. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know, there's my first one, that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. Then we have some further instruction. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All, sin, all wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. Then we start again with the we knows. We know that everyone has been born of God who does not keep on sinning. But he who was born of God, but he who, ha, who was born of God protects him and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourself from idols. So we see our seven we knows. And then at the very end, our passage takes this kind of left turn almost. In verse 21, little children, keep yourselves from idols. You can think like, where did that come from? How does that fit? Well, in light of all that we know, this is what we need to do. Right? In light of all that we know, of all the good things that God has done for us, we shouldn't turn to cheap, inferior substitutes. We need to worship the true God, not the inferior choices. And when we think about idols and idol worshiping, you can think about those weird old, you know, kind of Testament half statue, half man, half beast statues, and think, well, we don't have those today. Well, while we might not have those statues, I wager we have more idols today. And they're harder to see. Some idols are so commonplace in our culture that we don't even see them as idols. And idolatry is an affront to God. It keeps us enslaved to sin. It leads us into disability, and it doesn't satisfy. Instead, idols draw us away from the true God and from the blessing of being in fellowship with him. God hates idolatry. The practice of worshiping anything other than God is detestable to him, and we should hate it to the same degree. So we need to identify our idols and root them out, and today's teaching is going to give you a playbook on how to do just that. And we're gonna focus on verse 21 alone, those six little words, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. And John starts with that 
term of endearment, little children, right? He cares about these people. He wants them to get this right. In light of what they know, they're to keep themselves, they're to guard themselves from idols. You can ask yourself, well, well, what does he mean by idols in this passage? And commentators are split. Is he talking about literally the idols of the day, those figures that are worshipped? And certainly Ephesus is full of idol worship, pagan deities that were being worshipped. Or is he talking figuratively about idols in the sense of the false teachers teaching about a false Christ? Well, either way, an idol is anything that draws us away from Christ. And we want to replace the false with the real. An idol is anything that's more fundamental than God to your happiness, to your meaning in life, to your identity. And these can even be good things, things like our husbands, our children, our homes, that can cross over into becoming an idol. So we need to rightly understand today's idols. And that's point one on your outline, is rightly understand today's idols. A famous author wrote, idolatry is huge in the Bible, dominant in our personal lives, and irrelevant in our mistaken estimates. I love that. Idolatry is huge in the Bible. It's condemned throughout the Bible. And it's dominant in our personal lives. It is there. It's present in our lives today. But yet, we can overlook it. We can underestimate it. We can think that it's not a problem. We can feel like idols, well, that's a throwback to the Old Testament. And it's not so. Now, certainly there was a lot of idol worshiping going on in biblical times, right? The worship of those images or those statues for pagan deities. And Abraham was called out from idol worship. In Joshua 24, he's called to serve the true God. But all around him, the nations were still worshiping these pagan deities. They were building temples, they were conducting sacrifices, even child sacrifices. There was prostitution going on at these temples. It was very, very dark. The first of the two commandments in Exodus 20 have to do with idol worship. Right? Exodus 20, the giving of the law, in verse 3, the first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. And then in verse 4, the second commandment, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord, I, Yahweh, your God, am a jealous God. So that's no idols, no gods, no gods with a little g before me, and no making of gods, no making of idols, because anything can become an idol. It's kind of like a DIY idolatry. We can turn anything into an idol. And we saw in the Old Testament that oftentimes people would have one foot in each camp. They'd be following Yahweh, but they'd also have idols on the side. The real God is not interested in being part of a pantheon of gods, not being one of many, not being part of a hierarchy. God is not interested in that. Today's idols aren't necessarily worshipped in temples. Our kneeling and bowing is done with our calendars, our checkbooks, our search engines. And we get some clues as to where today's idols are. Perhaps they're not physical idols. But we look at Ezekiel chapter 14 to get a hint as to where are our idols today. Because right? they're hard to see. But Ezekiel 14 gives us a clue. So let's start in verse 3. Ezekiel 14, 3, it says, Son of man, these men have taken their idols into their hearts. That's where we have idols. We have idols in our hearts. And set the stumbling block of their iniquity before their faces. Should I indeed let myself be consulted by them? God asks a rhetorical question here. Therefore, speak to them and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, any one of the house of Israel who takes their idols into his heart and sets the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and yet comes to the prophet, I, Yahweh, I, the Lord, will answer him as he comes with the multitude of idols that I may lay hold of the hearts of the house of Israel who are estranged from me through their idols. 
So idols are in our hearts, and they create a stumbling block of iniquity. They create sin that then makes us estranged from God. Right? In verse 5, it says those who worship idols, they're, we're estranged from God. And God wants their repentance first and foremost in our passage before he's interested in answering their requests. You may remember in the Hebrew culture that the heart was not the center of emotion, but the heart was the core, the center of your identity, where your life flows from. And so God is jealous for our hearts, right? He wants to lay hold of our hearts, as it says in our passage. And it's not because he's mean or he's insecure. It's because he loves us. God has a deep passion for our wholehearted devotion to him. It would be like if your husband or your boyfriend was unfaithful. How would you feel about that? I wager you wouldn't feel very good. Well, God wants that covenant relationship with us. That's what we're designed for. That's what we're made for. The Westminster Confession asks the question, what's the chief end of man? And the answer is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And how do we do that? John Piper says that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. That's how we can glorify God, is by being satisfied in him. And when we let idols take root in our hearts, we're not satisfied in God, and we're not glorifying God. We're like a dog drinking from a toilet bowl. Maybe you've had a dog that drinks from the toilet bowl. We had an amazing dog growing up family dog. His name is Ben. Ben was a great dog, but he loved to drink from the toilet bowl. And as one of five kids, let me just say, the toilet bowl was not a lovely place in my family. But that didn't stop Ben. That was his preferred spot. Even though my mom had a lovely, fresh bowl of water that she changed and cleaned daily in the kitchen, it didn't matter. That dog wanted to drink from the toilet bowl. As kids, we were equally fascinated and disgusted by this dog. (laughs) But he kept going back to the toilet bowl. And so it is with us when we worship idols. We can forsake the living water that Christ offers for these disgusting, inferior choices. And it grieves God to see us making these terrible choices. It makes him jealous because he desires better for us. He loves us and wants to show us the better way. And we see this exact thing in the scripture in Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. Jeremiah 2, 11 through 13, it says, Has a nation changed its gods even though they are no gods? So there's the charge, right, of idolatry. Changing gods that aren't even any gods. But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heaven, at this. Be shocked, be utterly desolate, declares Yahweh. Well, that gives a pretty clear picture of how he feels about idolatry. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So these people, the Israelites, have forsaken the fresh water for runoff that's caught up in these cisterns. So the living waters, that's the fresh stream waters, that's the mountain waters. And what's caught in a cistern is the runoff from the rains. And these cisterns are pits that are dug into the limestone. So you know what happens here, right? When the rains come and the runoff fills in those storm drains, that's what happens in these cisterns. And not only are these cisterns full of yucky water, but these are leaking, broken cisterns. So what's left in them is just the sludge, the sediment from the runoff, and that is disgusting. They've traded the best water for the worst water, the mountain stream water for the yucky runoff water. And so that is what we do when we worship idols, right? We trade the best for the worst. It's foolish to forsake God for these inferior choices, and it's an affront to God. We're all worshipers. It's built into our DNA. We all worship something. We all put our hope in something. 
But when we put our hope in idols, when we worship idols, we're just setting ourselves up for heartbreak. Right? Idols will break our hearts because they create this overlonging, right? this over-desire for the things that we worship. If we worship something, an item, it's never going to satisfy. It will never be enough. If we worship our images, we're never going to feel beautiful enough. If we worship money, we'll never have enough to feel secure. We'll always be wanting to amass more. If we worship being known as smart, we're going to feel stupid and scared about being found out. If we worship power, we're going to be feeling insignificant. It's because the things of this world don't satisfy. Ecclesiastes 3 tells us that God has put eternity into our hearts. That's why our hearts aren't satisfied with the things of this world. We have eternity in our hearts. So we need to do a heart diagnostic, a cardiogram, if you will, to see the health of our heart, to see where we might have blockages, where idols may have crept into our heart. So point two on your outline is thoughtfully identify your own counterfeit gods. Thoughtfully identify your own counterfeit gods, your own idols. And the word thoughtfully is to put some thought into it. It takes hard work, right? Examining your own heart is hard, right? Sometimes we don't even understand our own hearts. So let's do a heart diagnostic. And I'm going to ask you some questions to ponder. And these are from Tim Keller's book called Counterfeit Gods. And you can get that in the bookstore. It's a great read. I recommend that. So I'm going to ask you these questions. I'm going to give you time to write them down. I want you to ponder them and put down the first thing that comes to mind. Don't overthink it. Just jot down a response. You don't have to share it with your group if you don't wish to. But here we go. Is there a thing or a person without which your life would have almost no meaning or purpose? Is there a thing or a person without which your life would have almost no meaning or purpose. Wow. Well, certainly, as wives and mothers, women, our thoughts could go to our children, our husbands, our families, our homes. What thing, if you lost, could almost cause you to lose the will to live? What thing, if you lost, could almost cause you to lose the will to live. If you lost your home, if you lost your job, what thing, if you lost it, could mean that almost all significance and value would be drained out of your life? What thing, if you lost? would cause almost all significance and value to be drained from your life. Your possessions, your children, your career. The answers to these will give you clues as to what could be idols in your life. Counterfeit gods. Anything that's more fundamental to you than God for your happiness, the meaning, your identity, your sense of security, anything you love more than God, anything you rest your heart in more than God. And they can be good things, good things that you're looking to give you what only God can give you. Now, some idols are a little bit easier to identify than others. Tim Keller calls them surface idols. Things like money, children, image, spouse, food. Those are a little bit easier to identify, but then there's some that are harder to identify. And Tim calls these deeper idols, hidden idols, if you will. So I'm going to read you four more statements to help identify some of these hidden idols that maybe you didn't even think were idols at all. So there's a fill in the blank here, and I'll prompt you to think it again. Jot down something that comes to mind. So here we go. Life only has meaning, or I only have worth, if I am loved and respected by blank. 
right? Life only has meaning. I only have worth if I'm loved and respected by my kids, my neighbors, right? my family, my husband, my coworkers, my employees. If that resonates with you, perhaps you have approval idolatry, seeking approval as an idol. Number two, life only has meaning, I only have worth if I have this kind of pleasure experience or a particular quality of life. Life only has meaning, I only have worth if I have a nice home or if I'm able to take vacations or if I'm able to go out to dinner a lot or I only have meaning if I'm able to stay home and be a stay-at-home mom. If that resonates with you, then perhaps you have comfort idolatry, comfort as an idol in your life. Number three, life only has meaning. I only have worth if I'm able to get mastery over my life in the area of blank. Life only has meaning if I'm able to have mastery over my life in the area of my career. Or life only has meaning if I'm able to have mastery over the li my life in the area of controlling my weight or reaching my fitness goals. Or I only have worth if I'm able to have children. Or life only has meaning, I only have worth if I'm able to be married, if I have mastery over my life, my life plan. Maybe some of you have had a life plan and by this age I want to be at a certain place and this age I want to be at a certain place and, and life only has meaning if I'm hitting those life plan goals. Or maybe control as an idol. And then lastly, the last question, life only has meaning, I only have worth if I'm being recognized for my accomplishments and I am excelling in blank could be I'm excelling in my work, right, in my career, if I'm progressing in my career. Life only has meaning, I only have worth if I'm excelling as a mother, in my work as a mom, in my work at home, in my, in my role as a wife. Or life only has meaning if I'm, I'm achieving things, I'm being productive. Like I only have worth if at the end of the day my to-do list is all checked off. If that resonates with you, then achievement could be your idol. So let's look a little deeper at these four hidden idols, and hopefully this has piqued your thoughts and you have some thinking about this. So those four hidden idols of achievement, approval, approval comfort, and control. And we're going to start looking about achievement first. Right. Achievement as an idol is the desire for success, status, recognition over the desire for God. When, the, when our desire for success and status and recognition overtakes our desire for God, we could have achievement as an idol. And a good test of this is how do you introduce yourself? When you meet somebody, what do you lead with? Do you lead with your work title, what your kids do, I grew up in New England, and I found it fascinating that frequently people would introduce themselves and weave in where they went to school, where they went to college, where they went to high school, where they went to prep school. It was very, very common within the first five minutes, you'd know where somebody went to college. That's kind of bizarre. But yet, we can do that here, right? And maybe you think, well, I'm not so overt. I would never boldly introduce myself like that. We can be crafty. Right? We can try and get that information out by maybe asking somebody else, what do you do? Secretly longing for them to ask us the same question. Or what do your kids do? Longing to be able to get that information out there about the things that your kids are doing that so, are so awesome. We can idolize achievement when we look at our kids and think that by a certain, uh, if we do everything right, that they're going to achieve a certain level, they're going to do a certain thing, and then we don't see them living up to those achievements that we've set. We can be frustrated. We can get angry. We can feel like we failed. 
We can compare ourselves to other people looking around at their kids and feeling like they're you know, doing way better than we are. Now, don't get me wrong. God values diligence. We know that, right? We're to work hard with excellence. Scriptures back that up. We're to look to the ant. So we're not talking about that. But when our focus on worldly accomplishments overtakes our desire for God, right? when we measure our success by our productivity, the God of achievement is distracting us from following Christ. We're chasing our to-do list. And we see that in the scripture, in the story of Martha and Mary. In Luke 10, you see the two sisters. One, Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet while Martha is in the kitchen, and the scripture says, distracted with the preparations. I love that, right? In verse 42, she's distracted with the preparations. She's distracted from following Christ. And you can have sort of a mental image of her in the kitchen. She's got her to-do list. She's crossing off what needs to get done to make this meal. And her sister is sitting, spending time with Christ. And so we can be distracted when we let our our to-do list, our need for achievement and accomplishment draw us away from Christ. We have a choice, much like Martha and Mary made their choices. And Jesus said that Mary has chosen better. We need to choose wisely. And a sign if you have an idol of achievement could be, do you feel like your life is defined by your achievements? Are you self-critical when you haven't been as productive as you want it to be, when you haven't achieved a certain level. Certainly our world rewards achievement, right? We are an achievement-oriented culture. We need to look at what motivates you to achieve, what motivates you to want to be successful. And are you envying other people for their success? That could be a sign that achievement is an idol. The truth we need to remind ourselves is that we are worthy in Christ. That's where we find our identity, right? Our success, it's not based on what we achieve. Our success should be in hearing, well done, good and faithful servant. That's the God of achievement. Let's look next at approval as an idol. Approval can be an idol when we crave respect and affirmation from our relationships and put that over God. And relationships are good things. Don't get me wrong. They are gifts from God. But they can cross into idolatry when we regularly compromise on our obedience to God in order to seek approval from these relationships. When we are willing to disobey God to seek approval from our kids, or our husbands, or our friends, or our coworkers, or our neighbors. When God takes second place to these relationships in terms of our time, our attention, our focus, then approval could be an idol. The early church leader, Augustine, calls this disordered love. And I love that expression, disordered love. These are legitimate love objects. These are things that we should love but we get them out of order. It's like a Miss Button shirt. Have you ever gotten up in the morning and you go to button your shirt and you get that top button wrong and then everything just is out of whack? Well, with disordered love, when God is not the first thing that we love, when that top button isn't God, nothing else lines up. When we care more about what other people think than what God thinks, when we live for our husbands or our kids or our neighbors or our friends' approval, when we get despondent, when we don't hear those words of affirmation, when we live in fear of thinking what other people are going to think about us, that's a hard place to be. Words of affirmation are fleeting at best. The God of approval puts us in a very tenuous situation. John chapter 12, verse 43, the Pharisees were criticized for just that. John chapter 12, 43 says the Pharisees loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. They were seeking approval. It's what God, 
thinks that matters most. The truth we need to remember is that God's love and acceptance should be enough. That's the God of approval. Next, let's look at comfort as an idol. Comfort is certainly the God of our age, right? Pleasure, entertainment, leisure. Commercials are targeting us on this all the time. This is our right. We could even say that we deserve this, right? The God of me, my wants, what I want, my comfort. I can become an idol. There was a very successful man that everybody agreed had it all. He had the luxury life, huge homes, vacation homes on big lots of land, beautiful women, children. He was highly esteemed, very successful at work, tons of money. He had the best food, finest drinks. He had entertainment galore. He had services, oh my goodness, he had cleaners and cooks and everything you could want. Every need was met. And yet, he was unfulfilled. He wasn't satisfied. He felt empty. You might recognize this man as King Solomon in the Old Testament. He was the king. He had these beautiful homes. Right? He had multiple wives. He was highly esteemed. He had a ton of money. And yet, he felt empty with all these creature comforts. And he documents his search for meaning in Ecclesiastes. And in chapter 2, he lists all his creature comforts. In Ecclesiastes 2.10, he continues with, And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure. For my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. He was successful. When I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity, a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. I don't know if you've ever tried to strive after the wind. It's not very satisfying. And that's what he's found, right? These things, all these things that he had, they didn't satisfy. It was like trying to fill a leaky bucket, right? A bucket with a hole in the bottom, and you keep having to put more and more stuff in, and it doesn't satisfy. These good things, these creature comforts that God has given us are for us to enjoy. They're for our pleasure, but they make lousy gods. They leave us feeling empty and discontent. The truth that we need to remember is that joy comes from knowing Christ, right? Not from our possessions, not from ourselves, not from our pleasures, but from knowing Christ. True happiness comes from knowing Christ. That's the God of comfort. Now let's look at control as an idol, our fourth hidden idol. Control is the desire to have things go our way, right? And that is such a tricky idol for we as women. We want things to go our way, and right? We don't like that feeling of insecurity or fear when we don't know how things are going to turn out. We can read books like 10 Secrets to a Happy Marriage or 12 Ways to Raise Successful Kids and think, yeah, okay, great. I've got this all figured out. I know how this is going to go right? And then we quickly learn that it doesn't go that way. We can't control other people, frequently can't even control ourselves, and certainly we often can't control our lives. We need to realize that, and control can be a dangerous idol. There's an interesting story in Genesis 31, where we see Rachel, the daughter of Laban, and she's beautiful, and Jacob meets her, and he falls in love with her immediately. And there's some twists and turns, but eventually they head off together to start their life together. And she takes her husband, her father's household god, and hides it and takes it with her. And then when asked about it, she lies. And we can pick up our story in Genesis 31, verse 33, and we see that her her, her uh, father, Laban, is coming out after them. 
So Laban went into Jacob's tent, her husband, and into Leah's tent, who's Rachel's sister, and into the tent of two female servants, but he did not find them. And he went out of Leah's tent and entered Rachel's. Now Rachel had taken the household gods and put them in the camel's saddle and sat on them. Laban felt all about the tent, but he did not find them. And she said to her father, let not my Lord be angry that I cannot rise before you for the way of women is upon me. What a lie, right? So he searched, but did not find the household gods. And that can lead us to ask the question, why did she steal those household gods? Right? We know that Rachel had a connection to the true God. Right? She is quoted as praying in the scriptures. She has spiritually guided to the well. What prompted her to take those household gods? Well, commentators speculate, but it all points to fear. Rachel was fearful. She's heading out on this new chapter. She's leaving her childhood home. And so she takes them as extra protection, as backup. And so we can do that, that we can look for God plus something for our security, that we're not trusting completely in God for his sovereignty, his oversight of all things, his management of all things. But we can look at God plus our bank accounts, or God plus our husbands, or God plus something. God is not interested in being one of many. He does not want to be in the pantheon of gods with a little g. The truth we need to remind ourselves is that our security is in Christ. He is our security. His promise is to never leave us or never forsake us. Control can be a dangerous idol. So as Christ followers, we know these things. What should we be doing? That's a great question. Point three on your outline is vigilantly guard against anything that would replace God. Vigilantly guard against anything that would replace God. And we get that from verse 21. Little children, keep yourself from idols. That word keep is the same word as guard. We see that word used when the shepherds were guarding their flocks at night. Or as you would guard a prisoner. So we need to guard ourselves from idols. And that word guard implies that there's something that we need to protect, that the enemy is trying to steal. Spurgeon points out that if a man has a box and he doesn't know what's in it, he's not very diligent or careful about protecting it. But if a man has a box and he knows that inside of it is a rare and precious treasure, he'll be very careful about guarding it. We have a rare and precious treasure in our knowledge of the true God and his son, Jesus Christ. We need to be vigilant about guarding that so that idols don't creep into our hearts. So how do we do this? Let's look at three steps. Step one, confront your idols and repent. Confront your idols and repent. And we spend some time on this in point two, but continue on going over those questions, searching your heart, asking God to reveal where there might be idols in your heart, and then repent. I'd say to God, I know I put my kids, my comforts, my achievement, my family, my desire for money over you, God, and I'm sorry. I don't want to do that. I want to put you first in my life. Strengthen me with your spirit to reject these idols idols. Call them what they are. Repent. And then idols need to be removed and replaced. We can't just remove them. We have to remove them and replace them. So step two is replace your idols with the pursuit of Christ. And as we seek to break these habits, we need to replace these little gods with the pursuit of Christ. And the Holy Spirit can help us in Ephesians chapter 4, we're seen to be putting off and putting on, putting off the old self and putting on the new self. That's what we need to do. We need to replace the old with the new, to replace those idols with the pursuit of Christ. And see it as a spiritual battle, which it is. 
it will be challenging at times and it can get discouraging, but we need to be trending ever upward in our victory. If you fall down, get back up, get back at it again. And to replace these idols with Christ, we need to spend time with him, to know him. Because the more that we know him and we experience the goodness of Christ, the less we're going to want these inferior substitutes. Then lastly, step three, you need to keep your heart healthy with diet and exercise. Right? That's common wisdom for heart health, diet and exercise. So it is for our spiritual health. We need a steady diet of God's word through the daily Bible reading, through women's Bible study, through weekly sermons, through scripture memorization, through reading books. There's a wealth of online content out there right now that's amazing. We need that good, steady diet of healthy spiritual food. And then exercise, right? Good spiritual exercise, like worship, singing, reading through the Psalms, prayer, fellowship, service. Spiritual your spiritual diet and exercise will keep your heart healthy and guarded. Well, while I was studying up on idols, I came across some very interesting practices. I wanted to share some of these with you. I have some pictures. The first one is of the Bullet Baba Temple. And you can see the deity there in the glass case is a motorcycle. That is a 350cc Royal Enfield Bullet Motorcycle that is worshiped in this temple. And this motorcycle has mystical properties. It was an accident and got towed away and it miraculously reappeared again. And so now the um, followers in India in this Indian temple worship this motorcycle. Yes. The next one is called the Airplane Guru Dwara. And this is a Sikh shrine where followers come and offer toy airplanes hoping to seek favor for traveling abroad and getting a visa. Who knew, right? I wonder how they're doing with COVID. Um, because uh, there are shops all around that sell these toy airplanes and they, uh, followers come and buy them and they offer them up at the temple to get favor for traveling and getting a visa. But probably my favorite is this last one, the Temple of Rats. Oh yeah, right. It's famous for being a home to over 20,000 black rats that are worshipped in this temple. And these holy rats, yes, holy and rats in the same sentence, they're called kabas. And according to folklore, the god of death has allowed her sons to be reincarnated as rats that are worshipped in this temple. And followers consider it a high honor to get to eat the food that has been nibbled on by rats. I kid you not. Right. Wow. Okay. We can think, that is crazy. That is so foolish. That is so disgusting. How, how can people do that? And yet then we rationalize our own idols. And we think, well, that, you know, that's different, right? It's equally crazy, equally foolish, and worse. God hates it. It's an abomination to God. We need to take idolatry seriously. We need to identify the idols and do the hard work of rooting them out of our hearts and then to guard our hearts vigilantly. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for these women that are here to hear from you and from your word. Thank you that your word is so clear about what we need to do. You are so worthy of our wholehearted devotion, God. So help us to do that hard work of identifying the idols in our own hearts. Lord, press it upon each woman where you see the gaps between the knowing and the doing. Reveal those idols to us because we want to be in fellowship with you, God. We want you. We know your way is best. You are such a good and gracious God. So please reveal those to these ladies today. And may they have a wonderful group discussion of transparency, of sharing where they're struggling, where idols that might be tempting them and be able to lock arms and have victory against these insidious, sneaky, hidden idols. We pray this all in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.